Suppose it were true that extraterrestrials are watching over our remarkable species. How would they evaluate our seeming willingness to place ourselves in jeopardy by turning up the thermostat of the planet? That thought ran through Will Daniels' head as he explored our record of climate change action and tried to understand why this problem is so difficult for us to come to terms with. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on this critical topic this morning, Will. Hey, thank you, Bill. And the name of the talk is Hope for the Human Age. As it stands now, human history and geologic history, the history of the Earth, are two separate things. There are the various names we've given the stages of our species development, Bronze Age, Renaissance, Atomic Age, and so forth. And then there are names such as Pliocene, Miocene, and Holocene, laying out the stages of change of the 4.5 billion year old planet that humans grew up on. Later this year, the separation may end. The two histories will become intertwined if a scientific panel votes officially to adopt the word Anthropocene for the geologic era in which we're living, signaling the end of the Holocene. Anthropo means human, so if we want, we can call the proposed new age the human age. It's easier to say. Scientists have been deliberating already for years on the proposed Anthropocene, a term coined about 30 years ago. They'll be applying some rigorous criteria, but the basic sense of the label is clear to the person on the street who has a good sense of the profound changes humans have created, especially as our numbers have grown to almost 8 billion. We've transformed much of the Earth's surface and even the subsurface. We've laid radioactive particles in the soil, accelerated rates of extinction, released plastics to every part of the oceans, created invasive species, and of course, produced a global temperature rise by releasing carbon that had laid safely buried underground. That was only a partial listing. In short, humans, particularly in our supercharged industrial and globalized phase, are the most significant thing to happen to the planet since the last round of ice ages. If the uh, International Union of Geological Science does vote in the Anthropocene, we won't be seeing an award ceremony bestowing the name on Homo sapiens. There was a time, and it wasn't that long ago, when getting onto the geologic timescale would have been an honor for humankind, our indelible stamp on the planet showing that we'd really arrived. We had been proud to subdue nature. Wilderness was the enemy, swamps were pestilential, Buffalo could be eradicated without regret. Rivers were there to be dammed for power and agriculture, and we could burn fuels and pump the wastes into the atmosphere without needing to think about them again. We're more aware now that we've often used little foresight in exploiting the earth as a resource without limits that we were obliged to respect. Having gone so far with managing and controlling land, water, and other resources, it's unlikely we can ste step back from it all. We're committed now and can only hope to make wiser choices in the future. The Anthropocene might feel like a burden, but if we feel it as a burden of responsibility, we might act more in accord with what is good for the planet. I recommend to you an IMAX film shown at the recent World Climate Conference, Anthropocene, the Human Epic, spectacular in a scary sort of way. The last line of narration in the film intrigued me, recognizing and reimagining our dominant signal is the beginning of change. We'd have a lot on the human age agenda, even without the reality of human clause caused climate change, which in this century has risen to the top of the list as the only threat of truly global scale we've faced besides the earlier ozone hole crisis and ignoring the nuclear weapons. 
Because climate change is a difficult subject to cover even with more time than I've left myself, and being confident that you know the basic problem and its seriousness, I'm going to focus on where we stand now in meeting the climate crisis, using as a convenient indicator last November's Glasgow Climate Conference. The conference falls under the umbrella of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which for 30 years has held the world's hope of averting climate crisis. This will probably sound a little wonkish, but I hope you can bear with me. COP26, the 26th Conference of Parties, was billed as the crucial time for action on the climate. The urgency was due to the strong warning that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued in its most recent assessment. The report said it is unequivocal that humans have warmed the planet and that widespread and rapid changes have already occurred. Adding more urgency, COP26 was set as the occasion when countries were to up the ante of promises to reduce greenhouse greenhouse gas emissions. Their first inadequate pledges were made at the 2015 Paris Conference, COP21. COP26 con convened in Glasgow on October 31st for a couple days of ceremonies and speeches followed by negotiations, workshops, and presentations until November 13th. This might have been the granddaddy of conferences 40,000 registered participants working in the blue zone beyond the security cordon, along with thousands of visitors in the green zone, doing exhibits and attending programs and events. I've heard of something called convention fever, that infectious energy generated among a large group of people united in a common cause and interest. Certainly the observers to whom I listened as they recounted the proceedings felt inspired and optimistic and had little hesitation in saying that much progress had been made. On what achievements were they basing such an assessment? Here are five. A commitment was made to the more stringent ceiling to warming set by the 2015 Paris Accord, 1.5 degrees Celsius average surface temperature. The Paris Agreement had set 2.0 degrees Celsius as the upper limit while also pledging to keep warming as close as possible to 1.5. Although even the UN's own analysis says we're nowhere close to being on track for 1.5, the countries at Glasgow recommitted to 1.5 anyway. Boldly or desperately, all hopes are on next fall in Egypt, when the parties have been asked once again to do better by announcing deeper slashes in emissions. The difference between 1.5 degrees and two degrees is a highly significant one. 105 countries signed a pledge to reduce meth methane emissions by 30% by 2030. Methane is a powerful, though less abundant, greenhouse gas considered one of the low-hanging fruits in cutting emissions. Tighten up the valves, prevent the natural gas from escaping, and save some money, too. China, Russia, and India have so far not signed on to the agreement. 141 countries signed the Declaration on Forests and Land Use praised as the first time the world has formally acknowledged that protecting and planting trees is essential to restoring climate. India announced that it would build enough renewable energy to account for 50% of its total energy usage by 2030. Last item, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero comprising 450 financial firms in 45 countries and totaling $130 trillion in assets was formed. These firms have signed on to reduce their own CO2 output to net zero and to require the businesses they lend to or invest in 
to have net zero goals too. That is a sampling of the positive takeaways, but that view is from within the convention center. What changed when delegates emerged onto the Glasgow streets to see protesters, mostly young, 100,000 strong at one point, they were much less impressed with acclaimed accomplishments because stubborn numbers remain. According to the website, Carbon Action Tracker, the pledges received for 2030 would at best limit temperature rise to 2.4 degrees Celsius, which is 4.3 degrees Fahrenheit. The elites inside the center, whether from government, non-government, from non-governmental agencies uh, or business and industry were making excuses, delaying, greenwashing, indulging in fantasies of economic growth, all adding up to blah, 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 in the words of the formidable Greta Thunberg. You can understand why this contrast of mood inside versus outside spawned the catchphrase, a city of two tails. The UN holding nothing back stated in the 11 page Glasgow Pact on November 13 that taking all the current pledges and site agreements into account and assuming follow through on them, emissions in 2030 will be 14% above what they were in 2010. Obviously not moving the warming needle backward and landing us at around 2.4 degrees. A different assessment from the UN, however, supports a less gloomy conclusion about the success of these climate conferences. Without the pledges made in 2015 and 2021, the world would be on track to warm by four degrees Celsius instead of 2.4, a huge difference. To be sure, the outlook is still dire and calls for the world to achieve in the next eight years, a rate of reduction far exceeding anything it's done so far. The UN mandate is for a 45% cut by 2030 in order for 1.5 degrees to stay in sight. The US commitment was fairly solid. We promised to emit 50 to 52% less by 2030 compared to 2005 emissions, which is the most serious commitment we've made in the history of these COPs. The US has already cut about 15% since 2005, still, however, much too slow a rate that leaves us 35% more to cut this decade. Do we have the policy tools with which to do this? Not yet. The proceeding was an attempt to give a by the numbers picture of where we are on climate after Glasgow. In this last part, I'll give four other observations that I hope will add to the picture of the current situation. The first is that equity is still the big stumbling block to progress. Countries such as India make the creditable charge that the developed world is responsible for most of the excess greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, but it hasn't done nearly enough to transition its economies to clean energy. It expects undeveloped countries to somehow do what it did not, raise living standards without relying on fossil fuels. The developed world also comes up short in delivering what it promised in 2009 at the Copenhagen Conference, $100 billion per year to help poorer countries change to clean energy and adapt to the effects of climate change. Second, all types of low carbon energy are acceptable. The Glasgow Pact uses the term green and low carbon energy, but it does not specify types. This will mean that some countries will continue to use and expand nuclear power and that fossil fuel companies will continue to promote keeping coal and gas viable through technologies that remove carbon dioxide as the fuels are burned and shoot the gas underground to store it. While this is technically feasible, no coal or gas plant with such technology 
exists now. Third, the Paris Agreement asked countries to state when they project getting to net zero emissions. Thus, the US has promised to be net zero by 2050. Net zero, which is the same as carbon neutral, means that countries may still put CO2 into the air as long as they remove it by other means. Aside from massive reforestation and improved agriculture practices, there are no proven and practical ways to remove CO2 at scale that I've heard of. It might be true, therefore, that most of the net zero promises overestimate the benefit of reforestation or rely on yet to be employed technologies in place of truly phasing out carbon-based fuels. And last, the Glasgow view is that economic growth needs to occur simultaneously with clean energy transition. Well, we've wondered here whether continued economic growth can possibly be sustainable. But at the conference, I did not see that growth was questioned. Outside, it was a different story. The main reason is the need to provide electricity to 800 million people who lack access. That goal is in line with UN Sustainable Development Goals. Such access requires growth, which will make possible more growth, such as starting small businesses. Another reason for silence on growth could be that attracting private capital wouldn't work well in a no growth environment. No doubt, enormous challenges remain. In closing, I feel that a good part of the hope for the human age does rest in the UN sponsored ongoing process of world collaboration to address climate change. There is fortunately a semblance of strategy in that process without which hope would be ineffective. Has the process so far unfolded in such a way as to give hope? To some degree, I think, yes, it has. But by 2030, we'll have a definitive answer. Thanks for listening.